Welcome to Streaming Dialogues, the podcast where insights meet innovation in video streaming. In each podcast episode, we thoroughly explore the ever-evolving world of video streaming. Along with our distinguished guests, we analyze the cutting-edge aspects of both the business and technology in video streaming. This podcast is brought to you by Jump Data Driven Video, the unified analytics and personalization platform for video services. We believe that with the right insights and the right people, we can shape the future of the industry together. So sit tight, open your ears and minds, and let's dive into the world of video streaming. Hey there, and welcome back to Video Streaming Dialogues. I'm Jeronimo Macanas, CEO of Jan Data Driven Video. Today, we have a fantastic guest on the show, Fernando Garcia Calvo, CEO of the Channel Store, experts in creation, distribution, and monetization of fat channels enabled. Fernando is known for his impact on pay TV and OTT, shaping the European and Latin American digital media landscape. He left his mark in companies like Huawei and Telefonica, where he was in charge of impressive video initiatives. In this episode, we will explore Fernando's insights on the ever-changing TV world, focusing on exciting world of fast-enabled trends. Fernando is known for his energy and smarts, and I'm sure you will agree with me after this podcast episode. Let's dive into Fernando's journey and his take on these hot topics in video streaming. Fernando, welcome to Streaming Dialogues. Great to have you here. How are you today? Hi, hello. This is my pleasure to be here with you. I mean, we've been looking forward to having this, this chat. I hope that many people will also enjoy this conversation. I'm feeling fine and really eager to start talking to you. Nice. Where are you? I see a lot of things, uh, green things oh, well. outside. <laughs> True. I, I live in the outskirts of Madrid, um, in a small city, and I work from home most of the day. So I'm, I'm taking this call from here. That's nice. That's nice. Great. So, Fernando, I, I know you uh, from a long time ago, so it's, um, but, but in the benefit of the audience, could you share a bit about your both your personal and professional background? Because I, I, I think you also have nice personal stories and, and hobbies that I'd like that you share with the audience. And also what led you to become a, a key player in the world of streaming? But uh, so basically who you are. Well, I'll start, I'll start with the professional part and I will give a hint on the, on the personal one. But uh, to be fair, I'm a kind of a strange professional because I'm a passionate about TV and entertainment, but I'm coming from a tech engineer background. I'm, I'm a telecommunication engineer myself, and I've been navigating all the value chain up to the content creation, uh, going through product definition, marketing, business development, data analytics, search engines even as well, and most recently even embracing the programmatic advertisement. I'm not yet into content production, but who knows? Because now it's easier than know. ever with, with AI. <laughs> Uh, but there's something always in common here. I've tried to to talk or to work always around distribution of entertainment in multiple services, devices, and regions. I'm an always learner. I love to be always challenging myself and my team to improve the products and offerings that we take to the customers. And on the personal side, some of the hobbies that I would like to share. I love hiking. I love biking in the in the countryside. And some of you may have even seen me dancing, but I, I'll keep it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Someday we will we will do a podcast about dancing, and we will invite you to dance. <laughs> okay, Fernando. So um, now you are the the, the CEO uh, of the Channel Store uh, that. Uh, you guys are doing um, a lot of things around fast, but uh, for our listeners who might not be familiar, could you explain what fast channels are and their importance in, 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 in today's video streaming landscape? Very simple sure. explanation for babies. That, that's easy. I mean, to make an easy <laughs> intro, I would say this is just the linear television that we are used to, but embracing digital technologies like streaming over IP and programmatic advertisement. There are three main factors that have accelerated this paradigm. The first one is obvious to most of us is the abundance and penetration of connected TVs in the homes, whether your smart TV or, your, or a dongle or a set-top box. In the latest IAB Spain market survey, 
there, there was um, a finding that said that 90% of Spanish households already are capable of connected TV services. The second one is the programmatic advertisement. Uh, this technology that was initially developed for web, then jump into the mobile, and now it's flowing into the TV space. Advertisers love it because in comparison with GRPs, the growth rating points, this, this, was the, this is the usual metric to buy advertising in regular television with reach and frequency. Now they can measure the ads being viewed. They can target better the, the, the user groups and even try new formats. So it's, that will be more relevant to me. I will not be like tired of watching ads that don't resonate with, with, with my, my hobbies. And the third is the low entry barriers. Now, until now, you had to apply for a license. You have to pay transmission fees, create an expensive production environment. Whereas now you can create a channel from existing library assets. You can insert live events. You can program your ad breaks. You can create an able library just using simple technologies. So it's like a revolution of the traditional TV business. And this is why the channel store is here looking in the long term of what is coming ahead. Okay, okay. Um... And, and what about the, from the consumer perspective? And, and uh, we all are streaming consumers, right? So what do you think, and I'll give you my, my personal opinion as well, but uh, what do you think makes Avot services stand out in today's streaming market? Because, I mean, fast in, in these technologies, uh, they've been there for quite a lot of time. That's true that now it's a, uh, a lot of dollars that are moving uh, from traditional uh, TV to this new connected TV environment. But from the consumer's perspective, because without consumers, there's nothing. Why do you think it's a, uh, why is the hot topic today? And why they are more and more consuming this kind of television? Uh, good question, because I think Fast and Avod, I will put them in the same in the same wagon because these are like twin brothers. So one is a linear yeah. way of watching things with ads. The other is a VOD uh, mode of watching ads. But in my opinion, when you look at the white picture of entertainment uh, offers today, there is probably a fatigue in the number of the SVOD platforms and millions of hours of content that you will end up browsing. When you calculate now the monthly bill that you have to pay for so many services that you don't like probably that much or that you don't use them that much, uh, you need you turn to explore other options. So this combination of link forward experience when I select what I want to watch or link back uh, proposition when somebody has decided what to program, to me, it's it's compatible and it's uh, complementing the, the SBOT subscription or even the regular television. So... I think this this might be the factor that will end up this uh, having even more hybrid models like Disney plus Netflix, Amazon Prime Video. They are both embracing the um, the advertising probably because you can we cannot afford to pay that higher bill. That is every two years there's an in, there's an increase probably in my subscription fees because there's no other way to to deal with 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 growth or production. So advertising is coming and it's coming as a as a way of solving issues for not being able to pay that many services or reducing the cost of the existing ones. Yeah, yeah interesting. I think uh, and I, I talked to you the other day having lunch about it, but uh, I recently um, uh, joined and test because um, uh, not, not just because I'm, I'm, I'm a professional in media streaming, but also as an end consumer trying to understand from consumer's perspective what is the offering of the Netflix uh, mm -hmm. advertisement-based service and Disney+. Plus. And, and I was really surprised because um, they did it really well. It's, it's not the uh, what we all imagine that is, uh, okay, now I have uh, a lot of ads like the traditional broadcasters are doing when they move to, into digital, right? So they try to replicate 100% the... The, the time uh, they are delivering ads to, to, to the end consumer and in the, in the case of Netflix and Disney and I put the uh, I will give you the example of, of, of Disney that it was impressive for mm -hmm. example uh, when you uh, watch a Pixar movie they just uh, delivered to you one block of one uh, minute of ads mm -hmm. and that's it 
the, the rest of it, so and that's a, a pre-roll. So the complete experience of watching a Pixar movie that is a premium content uh, is not interrupted from the end consumer perspective. And by the way, the ads are fully targeted. So my kids were watching this Pixar movie and they were the, and, and, and it was all about toys ads, right? So it was amazing. But at the same time, in Disney, when you watch. Uh, I don't know, a, a, a documentary, for example, then they, 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 they include also meat rolls and, and other ad types with a little bit more of ad pressure, but also quite manageable. So um, if this model uh, is, is going gonna, is gonna to grow, that I'm pretty sure it will, because that fixed this uh, end consumer wallet right the, yeah. and the span of huge amount of money because you can have basically two by one right in terms of cost you can sure. uh, you can have netflix and disney at package and then you can pay exactly the same that if you will just have one uh, pure subscription but uh, but uh, if this is going to grow what is the uh, what is the complement with fast so how you uh, envision that we will combine this uh, eight board lower cost offering that I think it's going to grow massively um, with the with the fast channel experience and, and and what are the use cases in our daily lives when we will go to the A board uh, mm -hmm. spot one or the fast channel? How you, do you think this so will be combined? This is not a question about the industry, but actually about user behavior. Um, so going back to my past time as product definition, a product owner, you have to be ready for multiple different user types in front of your services. And there are people that prefer just to sit and relax in front of the television and decide that I would like, I love this genre, whatever it is, perhaps it's a niche, a sport, or is a, is a nostalgic TV show or movies. And you prefer to just relax because entertainment is not always just selecting what you want, but just sitting and relax about what is coming. And somebody has selected a very good, a very good block of content that I, that I love. Then I switch to that and I tune to that channel, as we used to say, and then I watch. Then on the other side, you may pick your remote. And I hope that you will not spend 30 minutes browsing one service after another service, deciding what to watch, and then they end up watching nothing because you've run out of time. So there are the two models, and I don't think one is going to eat, uh, to eat each other. This is why I call that Fast and Avon are twin brothers. And in fact, you can see many services that are combining them. I think there's a lot more of product improvement to be, the, uh, to be done. So then an easy switch between a fast channel of a topic and their AVOT library is something that you should do easily from one side to another. If you use TV5 here in Spain, you can see an easy jump from the fast channel to the AVOT corner so that you can quickly restart a movie or go back to find more content of that. So it's not a question of, of who is going to win. It's actually both. Okay. No, I, I agree with that. I think it's uh, the, the key aspect here is about the user experience because you are totally right. Uh, if I'm watching Samsung TV Plus and I'm, uh, I don't know, uh, watching a concert, uh, mm -hmm. it would be great that I can jump into the Avot or even premium uh, subscription video service for the same content, right? So I can complete my experience or maybe uh, select something um, um, deeper in that category, right? So I think exactly. the fast for me now is more about, um, it's, a, it's a discovery platform, in fact. So I, I've, been, mm -hmm. I've been discovering uh, services that later on I, I have subscribed, like Kelo Concerts, for example, <laughs> and others. Uh, where I watch uh, live music there, and I say, "Oh, okay, th this is a subscription service as well." So, and then I try it, and I, I like it, right? So, I think it's also uh, a good way to drive in sure. um, subscriptions, right? But uh, um, so, uh, but at the same time, how do you see five channels enabled impacting the, the the broader streaming industry? And and what I mean is. Uh, um, especially for this vertical content and niche content that you mentioned, they have a lot of things to do today, right? So they need to uh, 
create a direct-to-consumer experience. They need to create their uh, um, fast channels in maybe 50 platforms. They need to create their A-bot categories. At the same time, they need to reduce cost because content is very expensive. They need to be more efficient. Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of macroeconomic challenges. So when I talk to my customers, actually, they, 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 they all the time say, well, we need to do more and more and more with less. Right. So um, how do you think all these new distribution streaming video streaming distribution channels and, and things that uh, the, the video streaming services need to do are going to evolve? Because it's not easy right, to put all these things in place. No, it's not easy. And there are there are um, I would say that we are at the beginning of a transformation or a disruption of the traditional TV business, the linear view. And I'm talking about fast, but remember, fast and Avod are, are the same are the same uh, guy in the block. Uh, so, what what I would say that we shouldn't judge this the industry at at this very 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 moment that we are, because we are now in the at the creation of a new market that is that is this this really the redefinition of the television. So. I normally call it as like waves or tides. So if we look back for the past year and then let's look a little, a little bit backwards and then we, we, we look into a forward feature. So the fast 1.0, if I may say that, was the beginning of this, of this phenomenon. It started in the US, proving that the technology was ready to, to do this kind of new form of television. And then there was a quick expansion with many channels. Right now we have around 2,000 channels in the US only, and probably more than 30 platforms in the US market. So many channels and probably at that moment very a lot of nostalgic long long tail content was appearing at that moment and we still have many of them the fast 2.0 probably is for the last three years if i would say as the quickly expansion into europe and latin market the, these markets are different to the us so not every everything works in terms of economy or in terms of appetite or in terms of players so now there's been a more selection of, of volume and quality of this, of this content. The fast 3.0, which, is, which I think we are right now, is when the big producers, sports right holders, are now awakening and embracing this paradigm. And therefore, using now Europe players like Dazon, Warner Bros. Discovery, BBC, La Liga, and many players exploring this field. And with these big, big brands really enter the market, then to me, this is going to be a game changer <clears throat> because the quality will increase. The cost also of the content will increase. Probably we have to rebalance uh, rev share models uh, across the industry. <clears throat> and therefore, we are starting a new era. There might be new tides coming for sure. Probably in content, we will see a continuous improvement in content quality. We will see broadcasters entering slowly into this game. They might be a little bit reluctant because they are used to a, a way of producing and, and running their business, but there's a new one coming. In terms of features, you said before, there, there are things that, that need to be solved. One is the personalization. Another is the discoverability. It's not that easy. Not everybody knows that they have this huge offer already available for free. And this easier switch between the Fast and Avod uh, brothers. And in terms of advertisement, which is, this is very important because we are all here talking about fast because there are people that want to spend their money into reaching audiences that are here. So if we don't look at what advertiser needs, which usually the media market perhaps don't, don't think what they need, then we may we may go slow, slower than we thought. So new formats, including interactive advertisement, not just buying CPM, so per thousand impressions, but buying CPL per lead, CPA per action, per sales. This is something that will come to the television. Somebody called this the shoppable TV. And there are many new formats being tried in the US and some in Europe. We need to measure properly the audience uh, and the campaigns. We need to help advertisers and agencies know what they are investing and how they are reaching the right audience. If we don't look into these topics and this technology, we may end up perhaps having a content that will not explode into a next, into a next big thing. And in terms of technology, probably AI, that everybody is talking about that, uh, is going to impact here a lot, uh, uh, reducing the cost of production including gener generative AI to create content for news, for documentaries, for even for animation that perhaps was very expensive before. Right now, it can reduce the cost a lot. So we may have 
new companies and newcomers entering with just embracing this technology that others have not yet thought about it? I don't know if I'm answering your question because there's, there's a wide answer here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, a lot of things here, but, uh, but uh, all of them, I think, are relevant. So, um, uh, well, you mentioned very important things. So you mentioned personalization, you mentioned uh, Gen AI, uh, you mentioned discovery. And, and so all these words are, are big words. So um, I think one of the key challenges right now, imagine I'm a US citizen and I'm on, on, I don't know, I'm in California and maybe I, I'm watching Samsung TV Plus. You mentioned that there, there is like 3,000 far channels out there. Two thousand, two thousand, two thousand with yes. with three hundred platforms, right? So, it's a lot of channel of cha channels to watch. So, uh, even here in in Madrid, I I sometimes um, mess myself in finding the right channels. So, uh, I think uh, the more channels uh, will be available on the platforms, the more uh, fatigue as well. Like in in Nespot mm -hmm. and the the. And the choice dilemma, right? That is, uh, uh, which channel should I watch or, 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 or I don't know how to find it and all these things. So basically search and discovery. And, but for that, one of the challenges is that uh, we rely on the platform's data, right? So, um, in, in all these far, far channels providers at the end, uh, at least today, have a lot of limitations in the in the data that these platforms provide to them. That is what basically we allow them to personalize the channel the channels even at the user ID level that today they don't have. Yeah. Right. So they can do collections. They can do some sort of uh, you know mix messing up the the, the 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 content assets, but there is no real personalization, and also there is no discovery on the platform. So considering that. What, what do you think um, the role of data and personalization will play in the coming, uh, I don't know, 24 months? Yeah. And how crucial are these in the success of our channels enabled? Because you need to personalize, but also you need to understand this monetization and understand how to make uh, content curation for the channels, all of that. So how do you think data and personalization will play in this context? That's a very good question because probably uh, I haven't emphasized this up to the level that it, that it means, but FAST and AVOT are to me data-driven television. It's entirely because I said at the beginning that this is just streaming over IP and for sure on streaming over IP, you have all of the data about how many hours have been consumed per user, per device, per region. So that data is already there. It's also programmatic advertisement. So every ad, we know how many of ads have been delivered have been watched, to which user, to which device, etc. So there's a lot of data that is being collected here and providing that we all support the GDPR uh, regulation, but there's aggregated data that can be, that can be shared without uh, using personal data. And that should flow in two directions. One is upstream to the content owner so that they know that this content that I'm programming or that I'm inserting in an Avot service has this volume of audience in this time frame in this region. This is crucial because they, this will help them negotiate better content or change their programming or, or even in try new genres that they haven't thought about before. Uh, this is one of the things that we are doing on at the channel store. We try to collect as many data or as much data as possible from the platforms and then doing some analysis of editorial analysis of what could be working better and giving some educated guess for some of the channels that we are producing. And downstream on the other side is uh, the advertisers. These guides really need to know what, how many ads has been shown, how many ads have been uh, properly uh, inserted at what time frame. So it's like creating a certificate of, of, of campaign uh, ads being shown. This is something that it's being worked right now in the US. There are some, some proposal for, for um, standards or measurements. But we have to make this data flow. And, and companies like us that are sitting in the middle, we, of course, try to send data properly so that we improve that. If an advertiser knows that this ad has been watched by these type of users or in these channels, they can better prepare and perhaps target 
a campaign next time in this area or that area, probably by paying a higher price, but the, the impact will be also higher. So the, the targeted advertising could work very well here. So I cannot agree more with you, Hero. This is, this is a data-driven television, and this is the era for that. Okay. Are at least, um, based on your experience and your, and your customers, are at least um, the, the fat channels uh, programming differently depending on the platform? So, for example, I can deliver uh, a different channel if I'm distributing in Pluto compared with Samsung TV+. Plus. Because uh, at least they have right now this uh, uh, aggregated data that is not is not a uh, very very detailed, but they mm -hmm. have information about uh, what's being watched, how long, where, as you mentioned. So uh, with that, at least it would be for them an opportunity to personalize per platform, and this and maybe this is what we will see this year. Uh, and then all the politics between the platforms and the, and the publishers uh, will continue. But at least this is something that probably they can do today. I don't know if that involves a cost or if it's something that, that, that there is a lot of operations involved, but I think it's an opportunity for at least uh, serving audiences in the different platforms differently. So Theoretically and technically, this is this is doable. Hero, you you can do that because you can you can give a different stream to each of the platforms. However, if you are on a on a market like Spain, Germany, or Italy, or any market, usually the distribution of televisions or platforms is a little bit uh, is is horizontal. So you may you may address the same user, uh, and the platform could not probably give you the best targeting uh, element for addressing um, uh, one type of, of content users than another. So what is being done right now is that uh, a content owner produces the same channel and that is being sent to all of the platforms equally. There might be some differences uh, when, when sending AVOD content, individual assets, then the platform may play with them, aggregating or promoting them in different blocks rather than a channel, but the channels usually are the same. Um, it's not a question of cost because cost could be something uh, low in general. But I would say it's not that perhaps it doesn't pay off at this moment uh, unless we had certain types of users being clearly uh, defined per platform, which is not the case at this moment. Okay, okay. Let's talk a, a bit about the predictions and, and, and the future. So you mentioned something that is Gen AI, that of course, uh, you know, I'm a big fan. But um, um, so I was discussing with my co-founder the other day, and we were predicting something pretty similar to what you said. Basically, I think it, we, we are going to see a lot of, uh, or new, new kind of type of video streaming services that are going to be uh, fully AI driven in content creation. Maybe it's not going to happen at the beginning in, you know, in, in fiction content, but there is other types of content like learning or, or, or factual or, or, you know, I don't know, historical things that, that could be generated by GNAI actually today. And, and one of my predictions actually for, for this year is that it's, we are going to enter into the, uh, in the same way that it's been a revolution in how we basically create text, it's going to mm -hmm. be a revolution in how we create video. So with that technologies, um, what, what I envision in line with what you mentioned is that uh, we will see OTT services that maybe are managed by five people and they can, make a, they can make a profitable business out of it just because the content creation cost is in, incredibly low and automated. And, and, and at the end of the day, if this content resonates uh, good with the right audience, it could be a new business there. So basically, sure. based on, 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 on your experience and how you envision the future, do you think and, and, and that we will see this kind of um, new paradigm in, in the coming one year and a half. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you, most of us in, in at the Channel Store, we have a huge innovation background before. So myself, I've been working 13 years in R&D development. So we are constantly doing forward looking into what is coming, 
what is coming. And we've detected the Gen AI as one of the key aspects. We are talking to many companies, even startups that are coming up in the US and in other regions and seeing what the trend is coming. And we, because we are an expert on video and we see that trend, we are starting to run some innovation uh, activities ourselves because we we fully believe that there are certain genres that will work very well with Gen AI. I mentioned before news. So having updated news uh, generated with even avatars or, or voiceover that is fully, fully human uh, sense or cartoons or documentaries, you said learning as well, Hero. So there are certain genres that can work very well with, with AI um, and we will see them come in very soon because the technology is evolving quite fast. We've seen demos that are really, really incredible. So Gen AI is going to be one of the trends for certain genres. I wouldn't call that for fiction or others, where AI may be used in the different uh, part of the process, but not yeah, or maybe it's the, the second phase, right? But uh, but uh, it would be a revolution with the initial phase in those genres that exactly. you mentioned. We've seen and even fiction will come later. Exactly. We've seen even a huge uh, reduction, of course, in sports. When you have a big 8K or 4K camera recording a, an event, and then there's some algorithms that are that are producing the the whole uh, broadcasting of that event, even with different shots of different parts with a single camera, and even creating the highlights. So imagine how how simple that could be. And this is already being done for sports. So if and a sports is very high demanding in terms of processing power, real time, etc. So if you we can do that for sports, then we mix that with Gen AI. Imagine what you could do probably with a small staff, you can run a company uh, working with this with this type of content. Sure. Great. So let's talk a bit about the channel stores vision on this. <laughs> About the let, let, future. let us let us let us uh, know and explain us what is why you guys are here and why you are different and how you guys are preparing to navigate all these future trends, right? Because you are not a you are a brand new company, and um, sure. and I'm sure that that you need to move very fast into these new trends. So explain us first what is channel what is the channel store? What is the, the how mm -hmm. how different you are compared with other players in the market and how do you plan to navigate these future trends? Well, th thanks uh, for this question. Uh, basically, at the Channel Store, we might be a new company in terms of this, what we are doing on the fast, um, on the fast space, but with the company that we belong to is a six-year-old company, so not a startup anymore, and is formed by a uh, huge team of video engineers, video developers. Uh, so this is why we are relying on the, the technology that has been developed for the past six years. And what we did in the last year and a half is just going out and explaining what we are doing. But the technology is fully ready. And thanks to our early expertise with big brands like El País, El Confidencial, Pocoyo, and many other of these brands, we've been able to make our own path in Europe as one of the leading companies being able to create, distribute, and monetize any content on the biggest European platforms out there. So Samsung, LG, Xiaomi, Raguden, uh, Pluto, uh, Telcos, etc. So we think that we are filling a gap that was already uh, that was in Europe. There are not that many companies in Europe being able to understand the complexity, the multicultural uh, topics of Europe. We are already present in Spain, France, Italy, and Germany with many channels and expanding very quickly. There are other big companies, mostly coming from the US, that are already uh, leading the US market by far. But we think that we, we give opportunities to the, to the content owners to create their own channel, the channel that they feel. We are not licensing content. We help them run their own channel under their own brands, under their own set of channels and then distributing that widely in, in a very, very short time. So we try to be more perhaps a boutique company, helping them understand the new business, growing their business, and, and, and making them grow as we grow. So that is the proposition that we have in comparison perhaps with other players that perhaps are more established, bigger companies, and they don't pay that much attention to the individual uh, content owners that we, that we we care about. Okay, that's interesting. You, you mentioned that um, that there's differences in how you create and launch and monetize a fat channel in the U.S. compared with Europe. We have some 
very good listeners in the U.S. that I'm sure mm -hmm. that they will they will be thinking in how to expand their audiences into the European market. So, which are these differences or difficulties compared with, between the two markets, the U.S. and, and EMEA? So, so, the big one I would say is that in Europe you have to be ready to support different languages. So that that increases your cost because you have to be supporting Italian, French, Germany. So there are five big markets in Europe at this moment. Uh, if we look at the market size, probably after the US and it comes the UK, Germany, and then probably Spain, and then France and Italy. Roughly something like this. There's not a clear metric to look at, but the trends and the volumes look like this. It's, so it means that you have to be ready to put your channel in French, Italian, Spanish, German, probably in English you have it already. So is you have to be prepared for that and also rely on a partner that can quickly put you in all of these platforms in a short time. We've been having uh, examples of launching a channel in four platforms in one month, when I'm talking about four, four big platforms in, in just in, in a month. Uh, and we, we are able even to launch a channel in four weeks or so. So it's, we try to be very fast, um, not only because of the work, but we, we try to be very quick in launching, in launching channels and understanding and talking to the different owners of each of the platform across Europe. So you have to understand that Samsung in Germany is not the same like Samsung in France, in Italy, or in Spain. We, we do have fluent conversation with all of them, an excellent relationship with them. Likewise, for, uh, Xiaomi, Philips, LG, Pluto, Rakuten. So that is what we can bring here to the market and ensuring that the, the, the delivery is very fast. And also the monetization, we pay a lot of attention to the monetization. Perhaps this is another aspect that make us different to others. We understand that fast is not only putting right content on the right platform. If you don't bring money to the table to the content owner, that channel will die. It will be in a month or in, in a year. So we have a dedicated team of ad experts, advertising experts. We have an ad ops team optimizing every single, every single uh, opportunity. We have more than 15 SSPs and demand partners connected, global, regional, and local ones in each of the markets. We can have also ad sales partners that ensure that we get directly to the advertisers. We are used to talk to agencies at the highest level so that they understand that connected TV is here and what is fast, what is they bought. So sometimes we look at serves at market dynamization agents. We are helping this market grow. It's not just that we want to make business in every corner, but actually we are making everybody understand that the new way of doing television brings this opportunity. If you're an advertiser, you have to learn A, B, C. If you're a content owner, D, E, E, F. And if you're a platform, you can do this F, Y. So there are a lot of things that we are helping and continuously making evangelization. We are participating in panels. We are we have participated in the um, in the IAB latest connected TV uh, white white paper. Constantly participated in the industry, so this is the way by which we are making this sheep move ahead. Yeah, I love to hear the monetization part because uh, basically this is something that we have seen in maybe in the last two years that um, uh, just vendors and technology vendors. Are, are anymore um, going to succeed in the, if they don't help their customers to really make an ROI out of the technology, right? So exactly. we, we, we are in the same page. We help a lot our customers to make money um, using all the different data sources that they generate on daily basis. And, and we, we see really that th there is a huge difference when you involve uh, yourself and your company into your customers' businesses and you really um, work together with them to make a better business instead of just providing technology. So this is fully aligned with that and I think that you, are, you guys are in the right path. So I think this is, we, we came up to the end. It's, it's been a, an incredible um, conversation with you, Fernando. I, I, <laughs> Likewise. I know that uh, I'm a big fan of, of your enthusiasm, especially because you really... <laughs> like what you do it doesn't matter what you do but you are always with passion and and energy sure. and i think that's uh, that's what really drives innovation and and make a better world at the end so thanks a lot for joining our 
our podcast and looking forward for more conversations. It's been a pleasure for me and thank you for, for inviting me. We are both passionate people, so we know each other. <laughs> and, and I'm pretty sure that we'll, we'll meet again in many, many events with you and all of the listeners of this podcast. So happy to chat, to talk any, anytime. Thank you, Fernando. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by Jump Data Driven Video, the unified analytics and personalization platform for video services. For more information, please visit www.jumpdatadriven.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you liked it, please subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube to stay updated on new episodes. See you soon.